good afternoon to all uh, we had a good lunch um, probably you feel uh, feel little sleepy <laughs> okay i love it all of you uh, we have an interesting uh, technology sessions uh, in the afternoon the first uh, uh, the first one will be the presentation uh, by mr jasper nielsen who has come from uh, denmark all the way from denmark uh, he will be talking more about the, uh, the the controls the sensors and controls play a major role in uh, refrigeration system um, operation so uh, you know mr uh, jasper nielsen has got some interesting um, controls Uh, which probably could be fitted into a part of refrigeration, whether it is an ammonia or you know, it's a DX system or pumped ammonia system. Uh, this could be used. Uh, you know, I could be able to understand that one. These are the systems which really have got a lot of potential to save energy. Uh, I welcome Mr. Uh, Nielsen uh, for making a brief presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is this a remote? Yeah. Mm, that's good. That is good. You will do that one. Yeah. Oh, you can use it, please. Let's get going. My name is Jesper. Thank you very much for joining. I hope uh, it won't be too boring here. Uh, after lunch is always difficult because uh, you had a good lunch, you didn't have the coffee, so uh, are you at all energized? So I took the hand mic because otherwise I'll just do as I saw many times in Poland, they're standing there and just speaking very monotone for a very long time and looking down. We can't have that, you'll fall asleep. So. Um, I was kindly invited. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I traveled all the way from Europe to come and see you today. Uh, I'm joining my good friend Samir over here and uh, we are working together. And now we will tell you a story from the cold Scandinavia, where I come from, how uh, we see refrigeration. Um, it was two degrees when I left Denmark, just two days, and we had snow the day before, so it's good to be here in Mumbai in the warm. So, um, a little bit about where I come from. Uh, I come from a little company called HP Products. We have been doing industrial refrigeration electronics for 30 years. Some of you will know the world famous AK AKS 41. It was sold to Danfoss for many years. We produced it and uh, we still produce it and now Danfoss has got another level sensor but some of you will probably know it already. Beside that one, we are doing a lot of different sensors that can measure if you have oil in your system or if you don't have oil, if you have refrigerant in your system or if you don't have a refrigerant, but then you have a problem. Or if you have water in your system and if you have too much of that, you also have a problem. So we need to solve it. So um, it's very much about measuring and understanding what happens inside your system. That is what we can uh, tell you about. So, as you can see in the picture over here, and as you all, all know, uh, because you're the refrigeration experts, I'm just the electronics guys. These sensors, they are built in in really harsh environments. You have uh, temperatures going up and down, you have frost, you have vibrations from ventilators, you have dirt and you have electromagnetic interference from frequency converters, all things that electronics definitely doesn't like. So we have been practicing, we have learned a lot, we have done mistakes, we have redone our electronics, and uh, we have many thousands sensors in the field and they are working. So, all about that. We are working with uh, 33 partners 
is selling our products right now in 63 countries. And in India, we are very proud to be represented by company Metalix, um, so they can support you locally uh, around the company or around the country. Say so this is where my uh, remote stopped to work. But what I will tell you about today is three topics. Number one topic is the safety aspect. The safety aspect is, of course, priority one. Priority one is that you always secure that your customers has got the right refrigeration of his products, be it, uh, be it uh, fruits, vegetables, fish, meat, whatever. But that is your most important task. So we'll look at that. There's also a, a personal safety aspect, and there's this aspect of uh, safety on the system level. And then, of course, uh, the system, yeah, we'll come to that. So next one is the uh, efficiency. Um, we are working uh, right now very uh, determined on optimizing industrial refrigeration systems. So efficiency in uh, how much co cold you have in your cold store and how little energy we can use uh, when we need to. That is very important, so I'll come to that. And the th uh, third part is the environmental part. All around the world, we are luckily now quite determined uh, to reduce our carbon emission footprint. The industrial refrigeration industry uses 15 to 25% of all electricity in our society. 15 to 25% of all electricity. Can you imagine that number? I must say, I can't. I just skipped actually 10 years of career in wind turbine industry to work with optimization in industrial refrigeration because we can optimize it big time. So I'll be touching that briefly as well. But as I just have 10 minutes, it will be quite a fast introduction to the topics. And first of all, you know to know a little bit about the technology. So the technology is based on, the next slide, here we are, uh, capacitive measurement. That means we measure the same way as you would measure a conductor on a print circuit board. We measure in picofarad, but you're not going to be concerned about that because we take care of that. But what we can do is, if I have two conductors, as I show on the drawing here, and I have a substance passing in between, then I can measure the dielectrical constant. And many liquids and substances has got different dielectrical properties. And if we look at the, some of these which are relevant for refrigeration, then we can see that uh, water and brine has got a dielectrical property of 80. And the scale is just 0 to 100. So that's very, very high. It's a good conductor. Ammonia, which you use very much in, uh, in India, has got 17 in property. And CO2, for instance, which is coming big time around the world now, is very low in dielectrical property with 1.5 to 2. And then interesting also, some of the oils uh, are quite low as well. We have this table. It's basically a table you can look up on the internet and anywhere else. And we know how to use it. So that is the secret behind our sensors. So nine out of 10 of our sensors are based on this simple, basically simple principle. So when we build a sensor, then we secure that uh, if anything goes wrong, and of course once in a while things do go wrong, I have to admit that maybe it is powered uh, with uh, too much volt and burn off because somebody didn't read the instruction, or maybe we did do a mistake. We can also do mistakes. But what we did to make it easy for you to change a uh, uh, sensor if you need to, is that you don't want to decharge all of your ammonia, for instance, in your system if a sensor goes, uh, breaks. 
So what you can do is you can take off the electronics. That's the blue at my side. And then the mechanical part, that is a gray part, that can stay in your tank or in your pipe or in your refrigeration system. And you don't need to take off 6, 10, 20 ton of ammonia just to exchange a little stupid electronic sensor. Because if there's anything that refrigeration people doesn't like in general, then it is electrical sensors. I have to admit that. So we are trying to push a, 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 a change. And the reason why we want to push that change, that is, amongst others, the safety aspect. Safety aspect. So I've got a little sketch here showing part of a refrigeration system, an example at least. And what we show is that we can measure different things. And I'm going to explain just uh, some of them um, because these are, for instance, sensors to measure if you have collected oil in your oil pot. And if you have and use the oil sensor, then automatically you can drain off that oil, lead it back to your compressor where you need it, because you don't need it sitting in that oil pot. But I have a guy to do that. Yes, that's fine, but he doesn't work Sunday morning at 3 o'clock when you need to drain your oil to keep your system going. So that's why we want to automize it. That is the whole idea about the automization. We want to have steady control, and we want to have consistent control, and we want to have a safe control because your customer's fish is also going to be at minus 20 degrees, 3 o'clock Sunday morning when your guy is sleeping at home. So that's how it should be. Similar to that, we can measure different levels, uh, level sensors. It's quite normal. But we can also measure what is inside your tank on any given position. We can measure if you have refrigerant inside, if you have water, and if, or if you have oils. And then you can manage your system with your main PLC based on this information. So that is quite intelligent. And our sensors can also operate um, uh, valves, electronic expansion valves. So if you need to control a specific level, the sensor can tell the valve please open, please close, and then keep a steady level. So these are, are examples of some of our more simple products, um, just to start somewhere. On safety, I s mentioned that we also had, um, are we already too far here? Way too far. This is where we need to be. On safety, I mentioned uh, personal safety. I have, for instance, the gray on top here is an ammonia uh, leak detector. So your guys working in the machine room, they need to be protected if you have a leak of ammonia. It's not too, uh, you shouldn't have too much uh, ammonia in there. So uh, we can have, al have alarms, we can control local alarms, but also central alarms, uh, opening uh, doors, closing doors, starting ventilators, and so on. That is very important. In many countries, you have governmental regulations that if you want to lead out a brine into a river, for instance, it is allowed in many countries, but you need to surveil that you don't have a, a contamination of ammonia in that uh, brine. Because if you have all sea life in that river will die instantly. So. That's why, for instance, we offer a quite reliable pH sensor uh, measuring where you are pH-wise. And then if you, uh, if you have a, a change in the pH value, then, then you have a contamination from ammonia and need to stop uh, uh, that uh, brine leak. Lastly, here on this uh, um, uh, uh, slide, I have uh, a blue sensor protecting from liquid hammering. The short story is that this little sensor can measure in your suction line going to your compressor. That is happening here. Here's a sensor. There's a compressor. 
if you have liquid coming into your compressor. So um, liquid hammering is a big problem many places. If you have it in, you may damage your compressor. You don't want it to happen. So therefore, if you can measure, which you now can, then you can stop your compressor because before it goes all wrong. There's a cost to it, yes, but there's also some cost to new compressors. So, that being said about safety. Efficiency. Um, I said that we spend an enormous amount of electricity in this industry. So let's see how we could potentially uh, update that. First of all, I have a defrost on demand sensor. Um, this is a quite new technology. It's based on the same principle on capacitive measuring, measurement as I mentioned before. So we have been practicing 30 years to do this uh, sensor. And uh, what we do is we have a wire, which we, a wire probe, which we mount between the fins on your evaporator. Then we measure if ice is building up on the evaporator because we can measure the dielectrical property of ice. When you have ice, when you have one millimeter of ice building up on your evaporator, then your efficiency decreases of fi by 5% the de efficiency in heat transfer. Ice is a really good isolator. That's actually funny, ice is an isolator, but it isn't. Because if you have too much ice, then even, uh, even though you can blow uh, air through your fins still, then the ice is blocking the heat transfer. We can't see it, but it just doesn't uh, transfer too much heat anymore. So we, we want to maintain only a thin layer of ice. So the idea behind this little sensor is that you mount it to an evaporator, and then you defrost when you need to. Now, we run a time-based, uh, most, most customers say, we run a time-based uh, defrosting. It works fine. Oh, yes, it does. On Sunday, when you don't have any production, you have stable condition. But Monday morning, when you start to drive in hot processed fish, big time. Yesterday was sunshine outside. Today it's raining. I have high humidity. What happens? My evaporator frosts up very fast and very different from last week when we had another production. So that is the main reason for defrost on demand sensors. I think it's quite simple actually. Um, so we will jump to another um, optimization topic, which is maybe a little bit more advanced. So therefore I'll first wipe my nose. Um, you will, you are, you are, I'm, I'm the electronics guy, you're the refrigeration in, uh, experts. So um, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with the h -log p diagram. And I need to explain, I need to show it here because the background and what we are coming to now is a sensor which can measure how much refrigerant we have in our refrigerant gas inside the piping. So in other words, this is the super advanced um, sight glass which tell us what is happening inside the piping. It is so radical new electronics that we have uh, received patent in the US, uh, very recent. We are still applying for patent in Europe and uh, we couldn't afford rest of the world. So there you have it. Um, but the sensor will measure how much liquid we have in the system. In the h -log p diagram, zero is equal to full wet uh, uh, ammonia, for instance. And one here is equal to full dry vapor gas. Well, so in theory, because if any of you work with DX systems, you will know that you have to apply some superheat to protect your compressor, but that's basically another s case right now. So we can measure if we have a full dry uh, vapor gas and we can measure how much liquid is in our system at the vapor gas. So the vapor gas is passing with 40 meters per second inside your piping. And now finally we can sense how much liquid is part of this gas. 
So the sensor will be built in to your piping as we see it here. And I brought a sensor because then it's much easier to understand. They can be some big ones. You can pass this one around. Or they can actually be quite small ones. You would like to see that one. It's a nice one. So, um, so that, those are the sensors in different designs and sizes. And uh, that's not really the matter now. And we just have to believe right now that size doesn't matter. Because nevertheless, it can measure that uh, dielectrical property and uh, vapor amount. So what it can measure is if we have pressure drops in systems, for instance. This is an example from a Danish very large cold store, Klaus Sørensen is called. Uh, where we install these sensors, we install them in two different evaporators. Evaporator 1 is a gray scale and evaporator 2 on top is the orange scale. We mounted the sensors outside in the Danish snow and rain and storm in, uh, on the top of the uh, cold store, so in 10 meters height. So the sensors are measuring what happens on the top of the riser pipe. Okay? Um, we saw then that on, on the evaporator number one, you have a really strange behavior on uh, the flow. In some, in some cases here, we don't have any uh, liquid coming out of this flooded uh, evaporator. So we, we want it to be on 0.7. So I have about around 30% uh, liquid coming out after the evaporation in the evaporator, but we have none. And actually, we can see when we see on, when we look at the, the picture here that the uh, pipes on the evaporator are not even frosted. So